here today with a, a podcast with a with a guy that I feel like I've known for a long time. I've only uh, had a couple of Zooms with him so far in the last year, maybe six months. Um, but I watched him on TV when I was a huge fan of the Rams uh, back in their glory days. And, you know, I only lived like 90 miles from St. Louis and we saw every game on TV and all that kind of stuff. Actually attended a couple of training camps. And uh, and and I think you're, you're best known, though, for the video that came out called Freak of Training. When 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 you and uh, uh, Jay Schroeder uh, kind of turned the whole idea about training kind of upside down. And uh, uh, how, how did you meet Adam? How did you meet Jay Schroeder? Yeah, so it was kind of a crazy story. Um, I've always since a kid, since I was a kid, was fascinated with a I want to get to the NFL, but I always kind of knew that to do that, I had to get bigger, faster, and stronger. So I was always reading, and, and we're talking now in the mid-90s, right? So really before the internet um, and all the information that's out there now. And, and so it really, I was relegated towards like muscle media and Flex Magazine and, and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so I just knew that I, to get bigger, faster, stronger, I had to train. And so I was always consuming content. So it was it was Christmas of my junior year in high school. And I was reading one of those magazines and there was this little obscure ad in in the back for a magazine called Powerlifting USA. And I asked my dad, I said, hey, dad, can I get this for Christmas? And he's like, sure. It was like 50 bucks or whatever. I think there were at that time, there were six issues a year. And the very first issue that I got was in January. Uh, Jay had written an article. And when I read, read it, I said, this is different. Like there's something about this guy. And I was 16 at the time or 17 at the time. There's something different about this guy. And I was like, well, I'm going to call him. Right. So I just picked up the phone. I called him. I told him I was interested. The, the article was something about advanced powerlifting and how to peak your bench press. But I just knew that he, he, he knew something. So I called him and I said, uh, hey, I read your article. I want to know more about it. And he said, well, you sound pretty young. This is for advanced powerlifters. You know, you have no business doing anything like this. And he said, you know, call this guy in Minnesota. I'm in Arizona. And I said, well, I'm in Arizona, too. And I said, where? Yeah. And he, he, he his gym was like 15 minutes from where I lived. And so he said, come on in. Uh, we'll talk. And so I drove over there and, and we met. Now, that's a whole nother story. I don't know if you want to get into my first meeting with him, but that's really how uh, I came to meet Jay, just reading stuff, called him up and the rest is history. And, and I do want to get into that, Adam, because I, I think you've told me this story and um, it was not a real positive first meeting, right? Uh, no, no. <laughs> So, um, so I was, again, I was 17 years old and, and, and this is, I think it's pretty important. It, you know, my parents didn't take me, my mom didn't take me. I drove myself. Right. I think it's really important when you think about kids, parents, coaches, I took the initiative, I drove out there. And so imagine at that time, Jay was in a six, 700 square foot little office building. Didn't look like much. And imagine you're 17 years old and you drive up and, and you hear this music coming out of this, this room. And it was it was like the the Russian Red Army Choir music, right? Like propaganda music. And so you walk in, and I see Jay. I see a couple bigger powerlifter guys, and I see another guy who who was one of the greatest guys I've ever met. Um, he's no longer with us, unfortunately. But there was another guy who was sixty years old. He was about one hundred eighty pounds, and he was deadlifting like six hundred pounds, right? And so I walk into this room. And they're working out and I'm like, wow, what, what is going on here? Right. There's a big Russian flag on the wall. There's Russian music. And um, so anyways, Jay, he ignores me for about 45 minutes. I just stand there and watch. And then he finally comes over to me and it was basically him berating me and, and belittling me for the next two hours, telling me that uh, I had no chance. I had no athletic shape that, um, I had no idea what I was doing or what I was talking about, that he would train me and write me a program, but I wasn't good enough to train in his gym. So I had to go out and do it on my own. So um, it was a pretty, pretty, pretty interesting meeting. But I remember I came home late. I came home about nine o'clock at night and my mom said, you know, where have you been? 
Um, I said, well, I was meeting that trainer. And she said, how'd it go? And I said, well, he basically cut me down for two hours and, and belittled me. And she goes, well, what do you think? And I was like, I think he's the guy. And so at that time, he his price was $50 a month. And I asked my mom, I said, hey, can we afford to do this? And she says, yeah, I'll do it for you if you think it, if you think it's the right thing to do. And so that's how we started. Crazy story. And, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong here uh, with my research, but you walked on at Arizona State. Uh, as a linebacker weighing 172. And then four years later, you were drafted in the first round of the NFL draft weighing 211. Um, kind of. So okay. I walked on. Um, uh, they they wanted me to play linebacker. I was, when I got there, my freshman year, I was about 190. Okay. So I was about 190 and I, I was there for five years. And so... Um, over the course of the next five years. Yeah. After the first year I earned a scholarship and then I played special teams for a year, became a starter. And then, then I was drafted in the first round as a safety to the, to the St. Louis Rams. And uh, yes, I, weighed, I weighed two eleven, And so I, I probably put on about four or five pounds, you know, per year. But it was, if, if I remember right, it was very gradual. Your weight gain. Absolutely. In fact, I'm sure we'll get into this. My entire worldview of sports and what I wanted to do was built on speed. And Jay had a kind of a contrarian view to most at that time. And we really believed that, you know, speed was king. And so even though I was a linebacker and at that time, the, the, the undersized linebacker was almost unheard of. It was basically Pat Tillman paved the way who I backed up. Wow. Uh, and I owe a lot of credit to, and then it was, it was me. There wasn't a lot of undersized true inside linebackers. It just didn't exist. And so where the instinct was, Hey, you have to put on weight. You have to put on weight. Uh, I resisted that. And I, and I believed in Jay cause I believed everything he told me. And he said, look, it's all about speed, right? If you put on weight that doesn't work, then you're going to get slower and you're not going to get, cause no matter what, I would never, no matter how much weight I put on, I would never be an effective 230, 240 pound backer. That just wasn't me, right? So I had to learn to play the game with speed and speed has dictated my entire career and my entire life. So you would agree with one of my poster-like statements that you should never let the weight room interfere with speed? Well... I have a different take on the weight room than most, and that's because of my experience with Jay. Um, the weight room with Jay is, and especially was, very different than what anybody else would consider the weight room. Uh, Jay was maniacal about technique. Um it was never about the amount of weight you got up. It was never about um, getting through the workout. It was about performance of the rep. And, and really, everything was about position. I learned that he uh, many, many examples. And, and that was one of the first few things that I ever learned. In fact, you know, that first meeting, he made a couple statements that really kind of changed my perception on training and performance that really dictated the rest of my career. So, uh, that's where I think Jay was 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 at his brilliance because he understood how the body is supposed to work. Um, and he understood that if you if you train improperly and you don't train with the proper technique and you don't ingrain the neuromuscular movement patterns necessary for performance, then you are taken away from your speed potential. Right. And so. Yes, I would say the weight room can can 100 percent be detrimental, but I don't. I wouldn't put what we did with Jay in that category. I think it was, it, he's a unicorn in that regard. Yeah, I think he's a unicorn in, in many regards. Um, and and I, I think that um, uh, your training of, well, let's just get to the point of your incredible combine first, and then we'll go back to your training. Um, at six foot to 11, uh, you ran a 4.46 40. Um, and- Four three seven, four three seven. Yes. Okay. Sir. So, so you're like one of the fastest safeties ever. It's pretty right? good. Pretty yeah. good. And then your vertical was also very good. Thirty nine. Yep. 
And one of the things that shocked me because you were not a conventional weightlifter, but but you lifted um, two twenty five thirty one reps, which right. is which is uh, that's in in the linebacker tight end category. I mean that that's that's uh, pretty unheard of for safeties, right? At that time, I think somebody since his bro that was the record for for defense. that was the record. Okay, yeah. I um, think it's still much higher than the the median uh, or the average. So uh, so yeah, just um, amazing stuff. Uh, and probably I, what's not in your you know that my short shuttle was a three eight three, which is pretty good, and my three cone drill was a uh, it was like six three seven which was pretty ridiculous um broad jump i think i was at 10 feet 11 so oh, it my. really it really didn't matter it was it was a pretty good pretty good all-around performance so so that, that that's why the the video is called freak of training um i have a good friend dan fichter uh who uh is uh probably he is like the next generation jay schroeder he is devoted his entire career to coaching football and CNS training. And I asked Dan for a couple of questions that he wanted, uh, wanted me to ask. And uh, well, one of the things, just real simple, uh, days per week and the amount of time. Let's talk about like off-season training. You're in the summer. How many days a week were you training and what kind of time? Well, it was different. There's kind of two periods uh, with Jay, it was the high school slash college period. And then it was the, the, the NFL period. And so those are two distinct, distinctly different time periods in our training changed, you know, dramatically. Uh, I would say it was, it was heavy volume, but when I was in high school and in college, many times throughout the year, I would, since ASU was about 15 minutes from where Jay was, I would do the ASU program. And then several times a week, I would go drive over to Jay's to do all the nervous system stuff. So, you know, all the stuff at that time they were doing at ASU was really traditional. The stuff you would say is that's detrimental to speed, right? right. That just right. It just doesn't make any sense. And so I would actually go and supplement with Jay on spring break. I would go with Jay and we would do double sessions a day uh, during the summer. Anytime I had a break, we would do double sessions. And so that was kind of my training routine. Um, when it came down to the NFL in the off season, we would start out, we would start out. Um, I wouldn't take a lot of time off after the season. We'd start out and right away and we would, we would go once a day for maybe six to eight weeks. And then right around March, April, we'd go to, we'd go to double sessions probably three times a week. And so the volume was, was pretty high. This is to me what the genius of what, what Jay did. And I think that people who didn't train with him don't really understand. Jay didn't have this blanket template training program. I think his genius was his ability to observe our bodies and the way we moved and understand, are we fatigued? If so, how do I have to adapt the next exercise methodology in the protocol in workout, right? In order to recover. And, and look, I'm not a, a, a workout scientist. This isn't what I do. This is just my vocabulary, right? Sure. My interpretation, but we would recover whatever energy system he felt was lacking. He would he would create an exercise program to recover that energy system for the next day. Right. And so it was this constant evolution, this constant changing methodology on a daily basis that I think allowed us to work out with intensity without overtraining. Right. If that makes any sense to me, it wasn't like, Hey, this is, this is what we're doing. We're putting this much volume in. He, he was brilliant at understanding our bodies at, were we overtrained enough to get a, a compensation effect? Um, do we need to back off here? If so, we would still train, but then he would change his methodology. He would change his methodics and how we work, uh, uh, executed the lift. We'd bench press. We'd do some sort of upper and lower body every single day. We would bench press every single day. Um, it wasn't a three times a week, medium, heavy, light. Now it may be light, but it may be high speed. Sometimes we'd go max. It was, 
I don't know the why or the how he did it, but to me, that's why I was able to get triple the volume of everybody else, but not get overtrained and avoid injury. I think that was one of the real key secrets to why I was able to get the results I did. And, and that's that's the thing that puzzles me because I am no one has ever said that I was high volume. I, I'm like the antithesis of high volume. Uh, but I'm also uh, a promoter of something that is kind of revolutionary, and that is that we should perform in practice and perform in training. And as you said, you know, like Arizona State back in the day, uh, they, they were conventional and, you know, they just lifted hard and ran a lot and all that kind of stuff. And that's the same thing teams are doing today. It hasn't changed much at all. It makes you slower. It makes you slower. It's ridiculous. And it's just, they're just plugging in the status quo tradition and they're afraid to experiment and all those things. And so here Jay comes and it sounds like he was pretty unscripted, uh, pretty artistic in experimentation and so forth. But, but if you're performing uh, in, in your workouts, he timed a lot of things, right? Even lifts. Yes. So performance to me, that's, I learned this lesson early with Jay. And again, he was the first person and really in that first conversation that really, really conveyed the idea of the importance of the nervous system and how that was everything. That's the everything. only thing that mattered, right? The brain connection. So what, what that's all we wanted to do was strengthen that signal to turn on and turn off muscles as fast as we could. So one of the first things that we talked about was that, look, you know, you want to squat a lot, but he didn't, he wasn't interested in me squatting 450 pounds in over three seconds, right? Because that, that doesn't convey performance. He said, I want you to squat 350 pounds in under, uh, in, in, in half a second or a quarter of a second. When you can do that, now your, your nervous system has potential for speed. It doesn't if you're, if you're just doing max heavy lifts at, at a slow rate, right? So that changed. It's not about, hey, get more weight on and lift more. It's all about performance, okay? Yes. Well, if you want to move at that velocity, well, your technique has to be perfect. Because as you know, if there's any power leakage, if there's any biomechanics that are incorrect, you can't move fast, right? And so in order to move at those excessive speeds, your technique has to be perfect. So those two things really, really changed my idea about training and about lifting. So I mentioned to you, he wouldn't let me train with him. So the first month I did the workout routine on my own, he told me to call him in four weeks. So then I called him, I said, hey, I'm done with this routine. He said, okay, bring in your results and we'll go over it. And I was like, okay, results. All right. So I went in there and he said, well, do you have your training log? And I said, no, what are you talking about? And so he just basically berated me in front of everybody again and told me I didn't have what it took and I wasn't disciplined or motivated. So if I wanted to continue working out with him, I had to write this training log every day. And so that training log consisted of my waking pulse, my waking blood pressure, my body weight in the morning. I had to record my dreams. I had to write down every protein, gram of protein, carbs, and fat that I had throughout, throughout the day. And then he made me, I had to have somebody stop watching time, the concentric portion of every exercise of every rep that I did. Um, and so I had to have, find somebody to, to time me. I say, Hey, can you time this? Like every single rep. And I had to record all this stuff and it took me about an hour a day. And so, but what, what it did eventually I got to feel, I could feel the difference in performing a bench press in 1.1 seconds or uh, 0.75 seconds. Right. I could, I could start to like understand well, this was a 10th of a second faster. Why was it? Oh, I held position better. Oh, my elbow was here. Oh, I was able to eccentrically load. Like I learned so much about my body and really what it did is put an emphasis on every rep matters. The performance of that rep matters. It's not just get through it, right? Yes. Because that to me was, was, was another secret of what we did. And it really, le I really learned that like, it's not about just getting tired. How do you perform, right? How do you maintain technique? 
one more thing, I know I can get long winded here, but one more thing that I thought was very important, and, and I see this all the time, was that we did do things till failure. But it wasn't when I start to get tired, you notice anytime somebody gets tired, either in the weight room or even running, the first thing that happens is their technique goes down the tube, right? They're just trying to get through it. They do everything they can just to finish, right? Well, we always wanted to perform and fail in position, right? Don't sacrifice your position just for the sake of trying to get the weight up, right? And if anything, Jay would spot an assist just enough so that we we're able to finish in the right position. So when all hell breaks loose and you're tired and you can't go anymore, fight the urge to just break down, force yourself to train in that position. And I think to me, again, he always used to talk about, you know, being in shape is being able to hold position, right? And so when you're tired, can you hold position? Because then you're going to be able to move faster and run faster. So Everything we did in the weight room was had to be, he was maniacally, he had to be perfect. Your foot position, if it wasn't right, we had to do it over again. It just made you be so present in your training and it changed the shift from, hey, we're doing this for a reason. We're not just trying to get through the workout, right? And I think that being present and being active participant in your training is another reason why I got the exceptional results. You know, another thing you're talking about exceptional results um, I believe, and correct, and I want your opinion on this, this is a short answer probably, um, you have to be pretty mentally fresh and physically fresh to do high level performance level training. Is, you agree? Well, I, <laughs> yes and no. Um, well, one thing I do want to say, um, just, I just want to go back as far as volume goes, um, we were much more high volume in the early years. Now, as, as, as we advanced and I got through the NFL, it wasn't as high volume. That's when Jay started getting more into like the, the, the long duration ISOs and that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. it's not as if we're just beating ourselves my entire career. Right. So like he adapted and evolved. And I just want to say that, but you know, I, this concept of fresh, I just always remember Jay saying that um, he wants, well, A, we had arguments about this, but but I understood where he was coming from. Our perception of if we're fresh or not does not always indicate, it doesn't always show in our performance, right? So I may not be feeling good, but he's watching me in the gym working out and my performance is actually pretty good, right? So it, he didn't go based on how I said I felt. He changed the workout based on how he saw me perform, right? right? So that's very, very different because you can feel tired, but you can still go out there and perform, right? Now, again, what I thought his genius was, he was able to change the workouts to get the, the, the effect that he was looking for. But he always said that my goal and what we're trying to do is you want to be ready to go at a moment's notice anytime, anywhere. You want your nervous system to be able to turn on with no warm up, just go out there and perform. Right. And so he wants you to just be consistent. Bam, bam. Like, so I didn't really care about being fresh, quite honestly, because I was just, hey, I don't necessarily feel great, but guess what? I'm performing pretty good. And then I had trust that he was going to be able to change and adapt the workout for the next workout and give me what I need. Right. So he, what the athlete feels sometimes, and he was big and adamant about this, isn't necessarily the perception and reality of what's happening. But I don't think there's a lot of trainers and coaches really with that level, that eye that can really understand their athletes, right? To be able to make those changes and adapt. Yeah, you know, my uh, you, when you talk about ready at a moment's notice, Les Spellman, who is is one of the best uh, NFL combine trainers in, in, in the nation, uh, talks about he loves guys. He wants his athletes to have motors that run hot, that that at a drop of a hat, they can sprint. They, they, they don't have to warm up for 45 minutes before they take, before they can sprint. 
you know, so so that I love that running hot thing. And, you know, the, what popped in my head, you know, your video, the video of you is called Freak of Training. But do you think you were a freak of durability and a freak of recovery as well? Um, I, well, yes and no. Um, yes, at an extremely high level, because I felt like, um, I felt like there was nothing I couldn't do. And I felt like it didn't matter. I could perform and I was in shape and I could play an entire game and, you know, 1000%. I felt like physically invincible and, and really, um, that there wasn't anything that I couldn't do. Now, when it comes from dur comes to durability, I think that's an interesting question because, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, on a punt team and you know, you, uh, your, your foot gets caught in the, in the, the crappy Astro turf and you get an, uh, an avulsion fracture in your ankle, right? Well, is that right. due to training? I don't know. No. Right. And then you get into a, a, an issue where, okay, so now, you know, I come back and you play three games later and now you have zero dorsiflexion in that ankle and now your gait has completely changed, but you're playing pro football and your gait isn't normal for another eight months. And then all of a sudden that travels up to your back and now you have a back problem, right? So I think it's, um, yes, I think absolutely. I was a freak of durability and in and, and recovery, but at the same time, um, you know, the back issue is something that came up and it, you know, admittedly, it, it did affect me my entire career and really for the rest of my life. Right. As, getting back to the the recovery and durability part, um, I totally understand what you're talking about with the freak accidents. I mean, it's a collision game and people are going to get hurt. And I don't I, I think people that are trained really well, maybe get hurt less. But but that's generally speaking. My point was more like, wouldn't there have been a lot of athletes who went through exactly what you went through from high school to the combine who might not have survived that training? Um, I don't think that they, a lot of people couldn't survive the mental demand that Jay placed on you. And, and really, um, it took a, a big psychological toll to commit to that kind of training. And I think a lot of people showed up and thought, or a lot of parents brought their kids there and said, well, Adam got these results, but the kid wasn't as invested as I was, right? Just total commitment that you're going to do whatever. And again, Jay, <laughs> Jay will test you emotionally and psychologically. And, and, and quite honestly, especially in today's climate with, with the way I think kids get coddled, people wouldn't put up with it. I'll give you an example. The very first day that he said that I could train with them, it was six months after I met him. And it was, uh, so we were in the middle of June here in Arizona. So it was 114 degrees out. And we were, he was going to, we were going to train at a track and do a track workout. And that was a black tar track on 114 degree day. It was at two o'clock in the afternoon. And so I was ready to show this guy that, Hey, I've got what it takes. I'm going to, you know, blow them away with my work ethic. And so I show up and I do, I was late because I couldn't find it. And so I, I join in and it was fine. Not a big deal. And then he said, okay, you have to do what they did before you got here. And it was pretty simple. Um, it was three 200 meter sprints. You walk to the start line, right? And you do three 200 meter sprints. Um, I did the first one, the second one, my legs gave out and I started throwing up. Right. And I was rolling around the grass, throwing up, just dying. I probably laid on the ground for about 15 minutes. And then when I got up, they had all left me. Like they just left me there just to die, I guess. Right. And so right. I had to peel myself up and, and I said, man, I can't believe they left. Nobody said a word to me. They just left me rolling around on the ground. And so I walk in the gym and the first thing he says is, did you finish? And I said, well, no, I thought I was going to die. And then he just went off at me again. Look, you don't have what it takes. This is our very first workout. So again, the, the mental, he kicked me out of the gym multiple times. I had to show up the next day and like at six in the morning and wait there for an hour. Like the, Jay made you emotionally commit to wanting to be the best. And I don't think people would, would, would do that. 
here's what happened though. When a lot of people came to work out, especially professionals, their body started feeling better. They started to move better. They got faster. They thought, oh my God, like this is awesome, right? We had guys like, that's generally the feeling that people got when they came to train. Yes, it seemed like a lot of volume. And again, the volume decreased as we became professionals, but generally speaking, um, it's amazing, but people's bodies and the injuries, um, I would say would be the predominant feeling that people get when they train with Jay. So it, it kind of goes against maybe conventional wisdom. They're, they're not just, and especially today, they're not just beating down the body, consistently beating down the body, right? Like, like kind of I did in, in the early years. And, and I think that is a product of focusing on the CNS, that, that CNS training. Uh, I, I tell people that when, when kids come to my workouts, they leave in a way feeling better than they felt when they walked in. That a lit up CNS is almost like a caffeinated effect where, where you feel healthy and you just feel better. Well, it's, again, I don't want to put words in Jay's mouth. It's, it's nervous system. He could care less about how big you get, but it's nervous system. And then, and, and then training in the correct movement patterns. So your muscles are used properly. To me, it's the combination of those two. Um, that really, I would say is the focal point of what he does, not just about sets and reps. It's not about sets and reps, but right. the, the body, the body moving and getting rid of all your compensation patterns that you've developed. So you can move the way you were meant to move. I think that that's, that's where he uh, really, really shines. Yeah. When you talk about getting the body back and, and, and getting rid of 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 the bad stuff and everything and and then also he was a big uh, believer in breathing as well and and you know that that breathing and resetting the body uh goes right along with chris corfus uh reflexive performance reset stuff where it's breathing he also did some um uh, some you know some hands on the body work right some massage type stuff certain spots didn't he um not he, you know, he's big. He really is a big believer and the proponent now of his, his uh, POV training, the electrical stimulation that, that, that they've developed. Um, that's, I would say that's probably where he mostly feels like that's his niche and that's his baby using, using that. So, Again, I'm not, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I would say it's all about the brain body connection, right? So when you, when you ask your muscles to do a certain task, they work and they, they work properly and they, and they work at length, right? They don't work in a contracted state. So right. again, I, uh, you know, Jay has, has gone in, in, in his direction of training and I can't claim to be an expert on the what and the whys of what he's doing. These days, I can only talk about kind of what, what I did um, in, in kind of those early years in my experiences. Yeah, how much did you sprint? Well, we, we in the early years, we actually, I felt like we sprinted, we sprinted quite a bit, a few times. A, um, it just depended on the time of year. It was, um, I actually looked forward to the, to, to the track workouts and we would do, he was big on overspeed training. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know exactly how many times, maybe, maybe once a week in the, in the early years, um, as we got older and, and in the NFL years, it, it became a little bit less. Um, I, I enjoy sprinting. I wish we would have sprinted a little bit more. Um, but we did, people were pretty astonished about the lack of running that we did training. And I think what they were astonished was we didn't do that high volume, you know, conditioning nonsense that people do, but yet we were always in shape and, and able to play a full game. Right. So uh, we didn't, there was zero um, distance work or conditioning work because we believe that that slows down the nervous system and you, and you essentially, you detrain yourself. And so we were not interested in doing anything 
whatsoever in the gym or running uh, that was going to train our body to want to move slower. What what did you use to uh, overspeed then? Um, there was a uh, there's like a there was like a pulley system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have them. I yeah, um, yeah. That, that they they were around 25 years ago at least. Yeah. Uh, pulley system with a, like a nylon cord that was unbreakable, and you tie one end, and yeah, it, 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 they were better than the bungee cords because the bungee cords pulled you real fast at the start. Yeah. And then not so fast when you wanted them to, you know, but the, the pulley system was, was fairly, uh, fairly good. And of course now they use 1080 sprint, which costs like 16,000 bucks or something, but it was, it's interesting to hear you say that. Well, and then, so, and then there's another one. I may, maybe I told you this story, but I remember it was in the, when, when Michael Johnson and Donovan Bailey in the 96 Olympics, right. And, and, I was again infatuated with speed. And so I remember we were sitting in Jay's office and we were breaking down both of their runs and just watching their running style. And of course they had very different running styles, but I remember saying, man, I, w I wish I knew what it felt like to be that fast. And so Jay says, okay. And so a week later he calls me and he says, Hey, meet me over here at 6 AM tomorrow. I said, okay. So I show up and and he, at that time he, he drove a van and he opens the van and he hooks up this thing to the trailer hitch with like a handle. And he says, okay, hold on. Um, I'm going to take you up to 35 miles an hour. You're going to see what it feels like to run fast. Right. So like, imagine there's no safety, there's no nothing. Right. It was just, I'm hanging on and he takes me behind his van and I got a chance to feel what it had to feel like to turn your legs over that fast. And, you know, I, who knows? If that had, now obviously it's pretty dangerous, but one thing I think that w what's important in, in, in life and athletics is that that concept of feel like you have to feel what performance feels like, you know? And so I think we overcoach kids, we overcoach people and you, you coach the instincts, right? But, but when you feel what it's supposed to feel like, well, that's burned into your memory forever, right? So I think that like all these things are super important. And I think that's, you know, in a way, you know, I know I listen to the way you talk about running. You have to feel what it feels like to run fast and you have to do that often, right? You have to imprint that into your body and go out there and sprint, right? And so you just, uh, I'm a big believer in that. So um that we did some pretty interesting things in, in uh, the Chicago area, of course, uh, in the spring, we get some really windy days. And I, I used to hate windy days. Cause I just generally speaking, I don't like wind. Um, with you. but, <laughs> but, um, you should take advantage of wind. I think wind is the absolute best, uh, because nothing's pulling your waist. Um, you're not, you know, like holding on to a van going 35 miles an hour or something. Uh, but, but a really high wind allows you to feel um, new speeds, and and I think if you if you're spiked up in your timing, you know kids kids are going you know just go crazy, and and that that feeling of contractions that happen like in like a nanosecond, and then the forgotten part, the relaxations that yeah. have to occur next, or else you get hurt. You are training your body to run hot. And I just love all that stuff. Uh, I'm going to switch gears here. Um, the type of training that, that, that Jay did, that you did with Jay, um, could be considered collision training, where, where you are absorbing force and generating force with a very tiny, tiny, tiny transitional period between, if any at all. So, so basically... That's what you do when you sprint. Your, your, your foot hits the ground at like 2.5 body weights and, and you are on the ground for one twelfth of a second if you're super fast. And you are able to, it looks like you're bouncing, but really you are absorbing that force and not collapsing and then generating a huge force to get back off the ground really quickly. And you're not doing this in a slow state. You're doing it super fast. And he did so many things working on this like collision type of training in the weight room. Like 
the things I remember most of all are the altitude jumps mm -hmm. where you would step off of big boxes, which is totally Soviet um, type stuff that he learned from the Russians. And that's probably why I played Russian music and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, but do you think that was a big part of your training? Absolutely. Uh, I think that if I, if I think back into the things that we talked about, obviously the nervous system was everything. It's the only thing that mattered, right? Okay. Well, what does that mean? Um, obviously performance usually is manifested by, you know, the concentric movement, the results are displayed by creating force, right? But Jay always talked about the need and the ability to absorb force was even greater because in order to create massive force, you had to absorb even more force, right? And you had to be able to store that energy and then be able to use it, right? That's what change of direction is. And so the faster you're able to turn on that contraction, you're reinforcing the signal from your brain to turn those muscles on and off, right? And again, I don't know if any of this is like scientific or whatever. This is just... No, that's perfect. You know what and I mean? That, that, that clip, that, that little five second clip should be, you know, like the clip I put out to promote this right. whole thing. It, it's that oh. whole ability to absorb force and generate force really quickly, which is totally controlled yes. by the CNS. Yes. That is explosiveness, that's power, that's speed. And, and every sport that I know of is a movement sport that even golf, that golfers benefit from speed training and this type of collision training because yeah. it's CNS. If you get two miles an hour faster sprinting, your golf, your, your club speed will be 15 miles an hour faster because the CNS controls all movement, which, so I just love that stuff. And yeah. I think you said it very simply. Um, the um, You also uh, did a lot of catching, didn't you? Catching loads? Yeah, so, and that was, again, um, I just, you know, remember, like I spent a lot of time with Jay and we had a lot of talks like this, you know, I'm, and now it's amazing how fast time flies. We're now in the, you know, over two decades since, since I met him. So I'm going back into the, uh, into the archives of my mind, yes. to these conversations, but, but, but they were important. Um, you know, what, what he explained to me as far as uh, dropping and catching was that um, when you drop and you catch a falling load, it turns off your self-defense mechanisms, right? And so your body now turns on even more powerfully than you consciously will do it, right? And so that was a way of circumventing and, and getting even more powerful contraction because now it becomes basically uh, a self-defense mechanism, right? You're going to turn everything on. And then the other thing that I remember uh, spending a lot of time thinking that when you do catch falling loads and you do have to turn on that fast, um, the muscles and all the supporting muscles in the, in the connective tissue all turn on appropriately the way they should and in order, right? And so you don't always get that from just doing bench presses or just regular reps, right? And so to, it was always, how does everything work together? How do we develop everything the way it's supposed to? And really, you're taking advantage of your, your body's natural reaction on how it works by putting, in a, a, putting your body in a, in a position to where its only option is to do everything right. You know what I mean? And so I think, again, that's my interpretation. And, and it made sense to me. And so then it's like, okay, that makes a lot of sense because we want to absorb it. And then how fast can we absorb it and then use it? And to me, that's sprinting, that's football, that's athletics. That's how you generate power. And that's why we go back to the earlier part in the conversation where that's why our training was different. And where I would say most weight training, as you would say, is detrimental but we didn't do training that way. So we, all of our training was built on how do we turn on and turn off our muscles as fast as possible? How do we absorb force? How do we create force? And how do we maintain the right position? Do all these things under a tremendous load in the perfect bio, biomechanical position so then we can go out there and repeat it on the field and we don't have to think about it. That's why I believe a lot of training doesn't transfer 
because people don't train the way it actually works on a field or on a track, right? Everything we did was built towards how do you perform? How does this work towards performance? And how does this prepare your body to go out there and handle the loads over and over and over again at that high, high velocity? One of the things you just barely touched on there, which goes back to the Dan Fichter training about the neurological aspect of, of collision training and all that stuff, is that the brain, one of the things in CNS training is that the brain's number one job is not actually performance. It's actually to protect us. Protect yourself. Yeah. Protect yourself. And so... I love the term that Dan Fichter calls the brain a protective mother. And if if you're jumping off, not jumping, but walking off a six foot box and, and absorbing that force, you're also training the brain to shut off in times of performance. Right. And I, I just imagine, you know, like, like you have to come up and make a collision with a guy when you're tackling. Uh, your brain will tell you maybe to duck away from that collision, right? You know, but you, a good athlete uh, takes away the governor and takes away the protective mother of a brain and is allowed to uh, have collisions. And like it or not, e like even in track where we don't bump bodies ever, it's still a collision sport because we're colliding with the ground. Um, basketball is a, every sport is a collision sport. And if you're not prepared for those collisions, you're not going to be very good. And you're going to really stress ligaments and tendons. And so that's probably a part of your training as well. Yeah. Look, you, you just touched on quite a bit there that, that, that goes into training and performance. And I, I talk about a lot of this stuff um, a lot with parents and just people in general. So I believe, well, a football is not natural, right? No. It's not natural to <laughs> run into people full speed, right? And I do believe that it, towards the end of my career, because of the collisions, I do believe that uh, subconsciously my body started to say, hey, it's enough, right? Like you don't really want to do this. And so maybe it's not, you know, the, the, the pace at which you play, you know, that governor that you talk about is a little, a little bit more heightened. And then once you lose a little bit of that edge, well, you're playing against the best in the world and you know, you can't play. Um, so I do believe that performance, you do have to be able to reset that protective mechanism subconsciously that your brain has, because you cannot perform. It's dangerous uh, to the human body to perform at these extreme levels right? It's dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's not, it, it's, it's dangerous to run as fast as Usain Bolt. Your body is not meant to, to handle that kind of force, right? That's only why one person can do it. You got to train yourself to be able to do it, right? So to live in the extremes, that's what we do as elite athletes. It's dangerous, right? And so that's you, you've got to be able to shut that off, right? And then to get even more out of your performance and training, you've got to be able to push yourself past the point that you would do it consciously. So I, I think that is a, a huge part of, um, of being an elite athlete and being able to circumvent that protective mechanism. And then it goes into what I believe being in an all in and in a commitment place, right? To be a, a great I think in life, but we're talking about athletics, you have to be able to be present and commit without a fear of failure or without a fear of the result. And that means like everything is all in, right? Right here, right now with no worry towards the past or the future. And so um, I'm a big believer that, yes, that we have to, we have to play in that space. And then the other thing that I think in my interpretation of, you know, dropping and catching and falling and all that stuff is just, the importance of strengthening the connective tissue, right? It's not about the muscles. You always talked about, you've got to prepare the connective tissue to be able to absorb all the forces that we're going out there and create. And, 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 and we're talking over a 60 minute football game over and over and over and over, not just the force of running, but collisions. I mean, it's, it's a lot that you have to prepare for. So, um, yes, I believe that the way we trained 1000%, um, prepared us and, and prepares everybody to perform at the extreme levels. 
One of the things that Chris Corfus talks about, just to illustrate for people that are listening to this and are like new to this, and I think a lot of people are new to this, you know, like, you know, traditional weight room people, traditional football coaches, traditional track coaches, they may think we're speaking this weird foreign language, but this is kind of the world I've lived in for 25 years. But but the, uh, it is one of the things that is totally true that if you, if a kid has poor vision, you know, like thick glasses, probably the slowest kid in the class. Or you could say this, you could take somebody, let's say, take you at your, at your best when you ran a 4.37 in the 40. If, if we put like dark goggles on you or a blindfold and said, I'll give you a thousand dollars if you run a 4.42, you probably couldn't do it because your brain would not let you do it because your brain wants to protect you. Sure. And one other weird thing that happens with track coaches, we have kids that that cannot sprint because they have hamstring tightness. And you say, well, when did you get hurt? Coach, I, I don't know. I said, well, then you're not hurt. He's about well, coach, it hurts when I walk. And what that is, is a brain shutdown of the hamstring. Why? Because the brain says, this is dangerous. We should not be running this fast. Yeah. So all that stuff about overcoming the brain, I love what you said too about we have to play with no past, no future, it's all now. And it it really has to be a let it rip, non-thinking type of play. It has to be instinctual. It's instincts, and this goes into coaching. You know, I coach kids, and 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 you know, I talk about football on TV, and so I interview. You know, I'm I'm with the the best coaches and players in the NFL, and uh, you know, I get frustrated because in this world, especially in football but I'm sure it's the case in everything. Everybody wants to be the genius in the schematics and they want to show all the cool stuff that they can do. But the real genius is how do you simplify it? So your players can play on instincts, right? Because I believe that most players at any level, um, they get a ceiling put on them because they get to a place where they start thinking and there's too much gray area and they yep. don't commit anymore. Right. And so, the genius isn't your scheme. The genius is how do I get my players to see the game better and let them play faster and play more confidently and get to a place where they can start to trust their own instincts, right? And so I think very, very few coaches at any level really understand that. But I'm a big, big believer that I think we we overcoach and we do coach the instincts out of all of our athletes. 100%, 100%. One thing before I forget the... Um... The other thing that that when I think of Jay, I think of the uh, like extreme ISO lunges. And can, can we talk a little bit about I mean, I, I think it's kind of counter. We do them all the time, um, but we don't do them for as long as you did them. Like for people who don't know, basically, you get into a, an extreme lunge position um, and and you take it from there. Well, first, I hate it. <laughs> I'd rather do all the volume stuff <laughs> all day long. All of it. I hate, I hate the ISOs. Um, I know there's value in it, but I, I hate it. Um, so uh, <laughs> I remember the very first day. Uh, I remember the day, the genesis of the, the ISO holds. Uh, we walked into the gym one day and he said, okay, you know what the cambered bench press bar is, right? The mm -hmm. one that yep. has, you know, where you go really deep. Yep. So he said, we put 225 on and you're going to hold this on your chest for five minutes. <laughs> and I was like, of course, I was like, all right, cool. And I was like, I'm sitting there and I was like, oh my God, like, what if like, I'm going to die right now. But literally there was no like, hey, we're not easing into this. I had to figure out how to like, and again, a lot of the weights now resting, right? But it's such an extreme, it's not crushing my chest, but that day was the genesis of the ISO holds, right? And so that's, you know, he, he, he went on to explain, well, you know, I believe that when you train at the extreme ranges of motion, it, 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 it strengthens the entire range. Right. And so that was kind of, the this was in 99 ish. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, again, this is, you know, nobody was talking about this stuff. 
Um, and I also believe that it that, that it does uh, uh, train you how to be able to hold these positions at the extreme joint angles, right? And so then it, it trains your muscles to be able to work the proper way. I'll give you a story one day. Um, Jay had a tendency of, um, again, he's, he wasn't always in a great mood, but we had just come back from one of our seasons and it was in January. And so we're tired, we're beat up, like we're weak from the season. And he was pretty upset with us about something. Uh, we weren't working hard enough in the gym. And, and he said, okay, you guys are going to do uh, ISO lunges. You're going to do four minutes each leg. And there was no way. He said, every time you stop, you have to add a minute and a half to your time. Okay. Uh, Tony, we were there doing lunges. It took us two hours to finish. So we probably ended up doing 30 five minutes of active because i mean we got tired but we we got tired and failed before the two minute mark right so you're you know you may have got your time down but now all of a sudden you got to add a minute and a half right and so we're just sitting there dying so like that's the kind of stuff that that he that he made us so finally we had to take like you know 15 minutes rest we're like hey we got to rest more so it took us it took us two hours to finish four minutes of, of iso lunges um but yeah, so the, Jay is is really big into those. I I hate it. I, give me volume all day long. Uh, I do understand the importance of it, but it is it's boring. I I wish there was another way. Now, did, did he ever talk about the idea that I think I've read about him saying is that people think that there is no uh, movement or no contractions in in, in an ISO. I guess no movement in ISO lunges, but he says there actually is movement. And it's an extreme slow eccentric is really what it becomes. Yes. And, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but have you ever witnessed what I consider like an extreme ISO lunge, what I call the jackhammer effect where the front leg starts twitching. And, and oh, yeah. I, I think it's co-contractions going on. And, but you know, like, you know, I'm more of a chemistry guy than a kinesiologist. Um, but but I think there's co-contractions going on and 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 the foot, which we try to get, keep the heel slightly off the ground, the 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 foot starts bouncing like a jackhammer. And and then to throw in all that stuff, there's typically not soreness the next day because you're not going through massive eccentric stuff. Is that your experience? Yeah, well, it's been a while. Um I I, I don't choose to, to no. do those on purpose. Never. <laughs> Um, yeah, like I said, um, as so a lot of people that you started training with us after I went to the NFL, Jay shifted again, it was a def different shift in his philosophy. Uh, a lot of the stuff we did in the early days with me that I experienced was a lot of the super, super, super high volume. And then it went into more of the performance stuff and the, in the, and the ISO extremes and the, the ARP wave stuff and the PLV stuff and the neurological training. Um, very, 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 very different. And I used to long for the good old days. I'm just an old fashioned. I, you know, I used to be like, man, I hate doing this. Can't we just do all the, the volume stuff that we used to do? Um, that's just me personally, because that's, that's kind of what I grew up doing. So I gravitate more towards that. But I, I, again, I told you this a little while ago, there's a lot of people had a lot of different perceptions about our training because they only saw snippets on television or a certain video into, and, and if you just think that's all that it was, well, then you're like, well, this is stuff is too dangerous. You can't do this. It's not right. But nobody really understands how Jay being present, how he, how he observed the workouts and put it all together and all the different things that were related to performance. Um, most, pretty much everybody that trains or goes to see Jay, again, the first thing they notice is how good my body feels. My body feels great. And, and it's amazing. It doesn't matter what athlete you are because he doesn't make you train in positions that put stress on your joints and your ligaments, right? And so that's that's really one of the keys, right? Everything you do is trained in a biomechanically correct position. And if it's not, 
they train your body and your brain and that signal how to get into that position. And when you train in the most efficient position possible, your body doesn't hurt. It's that easy, right? And I, I don't believe from what I see out there that, that people um, train in the proper positions. I think that's where he really is at an elite level of understanding how the body is supposed to move and then how to train it for performance uh, in those, in those movements. That makes you know, the thing that just popped in my head there. You mentioned how, how you can still perform uh, with proper mechanics and, and, uh, and, and body positions, even when you're fatigued, but you also contrasted that with how a lot of people under fatigue get sloppy in their mechanics sloppy in their positions and and so maybe it is that trained sloppiness that creates soreness and makes you feel like crap i would imagine and then the other thing is you know there's a lot of you know this conversation brings up a lot of different thousands of conversations that i've had in the past I would say um Another key concept of what Jay really imprinted on me is the importance on the eccentric part of the exercise. Um, almost all people, when they perform that part of the exercise, allow gravity to lower them into position. And that goes into the joints. But when there's this concept of pulling yourself into position with the antagonistic muscles, that now load the connective tissue in the muscles and off of the joints, right? And so there's an art to performing the eccentric part of the lift and elongating those muscles. That doesn't happen when you just allow gravity to pull you into a squat or a bench press, right? And so, you know, for example, on a bench press, it's not just lower it, you know, you're you're pulling, you're actively pulling into position, right? And you're, 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 you're not resisting it like a negative. You're not trying to hold it up. You're pulling it, right? So you're actively using these muscles. Again, the detail of the training that we did in the performance of the exercises, again, I never see anybody to this day talk about this stuff. But like every single thing that we did was with that level of detail of feeling the way your body's supposed to work. How do you pull yourself into a lunge? Don't just lower yourself and let gravity because then the, all the force goes into your joints and then all of a sudden your knee hurts or your ankle, whatever, right? Again, that these are the things, like all these little details that you can't get from just, hey, we're going to do this these sets and reps because so-and-so does this kind of a workout. It doesn't work like that. You've got to actively participate and holistically put it all together. Um, those are the things from those videos that people don't understand. No, no. The level of, um, of intellectual participation that you have to put into your training is just as important as the physical exertion, right? You, you can't just show up and do the workout. Yes, yeah. and, and there's nuance. I think all coaches have incredible nuance that if you plug in somebody's playbook into your high school football team, you're going to suck, you know, it, because yeah. the important things in those plays are not the plays. It's the nuance, the little things, but yeah. one of the things that, um, uh, that Dan Fichter does, and I think it's, it's, it's hard, um, hard to, for me to tell a 16 year old kid to get down on a lunge position, but activate that front hamstring. Let's, let's pull, let's, let's feel a pull. And I, I think they have a hard time not doing just what you said, which is just hold and, 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 you know, try to support against gravity, which only goes into your joints and not your connective tissue. So he, he does a thing where he just gets a, a, a band and pulls on the calf, that front calf a little bit so that the kid kind of feels the, where he has to pull back then. And he's just lighting up a part of that kid's brain that gets him to do that thing well. And that's nuance. And then the other nuance I just love, because as I've told you, my X Factor stuff has was all based on you and what Jay did with you. And when 
when I promote my stuff and people say, coach, I need sets and reps for your X factor stuff. I said, they don't like my answer. My answer is I don't do sets and reps. It's unscripted. It's free flowing. It's sometimes experimental. And, and I do it by feel by, you know, I, I hate to call myself an artist, but, but I'm not, I'm not quantitative in our X factor stuff. You know, like a kid might be able to do tons of med ball throws, but only a couple Russian lunges because they're so intense. And so all that stuff has just been reaffirming to me. Look, I think that um, the best people that do anything in life, it is art and you are an artist. I think that you have to have, you have to have core fundamentals. You have to go have core principles. And really the 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 10,000 minutes that people talk about or the 10,000 hours that people talk about isn't, it's not a participation grade, right? Oh. It's not like, hey, I do this, right? Those, the reason why it works is because if you spend that amount of time actively participating mentally, well, then now it becomes a part of your instinct and that's what allows you to become the artist, right? You have to have a certain fundamental tools, but until you own that process, it takes that amount of time and experience of feeling these things, right? You can't just read it from a book. You can't just listen to you or listen to me or listen to a lecture Jay gives. You have to feel these things. You have to internalize all these things. And then you have to, then your interpretation is your art. Right. And so I'm a big believer in that. And again, it, it, I don't care if you're doing this or if you're calling plays on offense or you're a football coach or if you're just, you know, an entrepreneur. Right. I just think that that's why I have a hard time with the phrase just work hard. Um, that implies that you're just entitled just because you put in the time, but that it's not that. Right if you're not actively participating and you're not actively trying to feel these things and you're not obsessively always thinking about it and how to make it better, well, then you're just, you're always going to be stuck in the science part. And then you're going to be confined by numbers and graphs and all kinds of crap while the artists are out there doing all the cool stuff, right? The guys that yeah. really make the game different. Yep. That, that's, that's a real good ending, but I, I got, I mean, like I got like, like a, a true ending here. Um, two questions. One is, would you do it all over again? Which part? <laughs> Great. Yeah. Would, would you go through all the stuff you went through from the day you called up Jay to the, uh, to the end of your football career? Would you do all that all over again? Um, you know, what's funny, I, I gave a, uh, a talk in front of a, a group for a friend of mine that said a big, a big consulting firm. And um, it was with 120 or so of the his senior leadership team. And he, he actually opened up the, the, the talk. It was kind of a Q&A session. This was last year, about a year ago today. And he actually opened up this talk with that ESPN video of me and Jay. And so... It was funny because I, I kind of thought about this question that you asked me. I honestly, I miss those days. I, 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 it, I really, how do I say this? It, that those days were like, the, like the days, right? When, when it all came together and you were just active and you were just like in it. Um, that, that those were the days you felt most alive as a human. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because you're just like, you're so intense and you're so present and you're so just locked in and you're just, it's all about performing. It's like, yeah, absolutely. I do it again. I miss that because that's like, without that, that's what we all want. That's what keeps us going. Right. Like just being that intense and that present. Um, absolutely. I do it 100% again. I, I, I miss it. And I wish I could go back and <laughs> I wish I could do it now, but my body, I don't think would let me. As, as not the second question, but the follow-up to that question. Uh, is there anything you said I could ask anything? Um, 
that is there anything in your life? I've heard that the life of a retired professional athlete is one of the hardest lives in the world. Um, probably because you almost got emotional talking about, sure. uh, about the days. And is there anything that you have found in your present life? And it's okay to say no, that stirs your blood like that. Um, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, obviously I, it's funny. I get the older I get, I get a lot more emotional. I get emotional all the time. Um, yeah. Me too. I think this is probably for another podcast, like the mental and emotional part. Our of, next one. But our next podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because you can, I spent a lot of, a lot of time thinking about how we develop into men and who I was then, who I am now, that transformation where you're the center of the universe right and the 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 everything starts and ends with you and how that could be a house of cards to a certain extent and then when that's gone you have this empty feeling because you feel like well what is there is that it right it's kind of that thing so yeah. i've gone through a tremendous tremendous growth process um my career didn't end the way i wanted it to and it was i was at a very low point in my life. Um, it just happened to coincide with the birth of my first son. Um, and, and really I would say I went from a person that I, you know, I'm ashamed of a lot of the, the ways that I, the way, the ways that I acted and the way, the things that I believed in when I played football. Um, and so I think that when you start to transition and, and in full disclosure, when you, when you finally you finally find God and, and what that means when that really wasn't a part of your life. And you start to understand that your role is to be more of a servant rather than to be here for yourself. It's a powerful transformation. So, um, yeah, I think it's very hard for, for a lot of athletes because I think a lot of get, guys get stuck in that identity. And I think it's a false identity. I think that, um, when everything begins and ends with you and your career and you being an athlete and you having money or whatever it is, and you don't have something else that's actually real and tangible, that's fulfilling. I think it's a, it's a pretty cold, empty place. That's, that's really powerful stuff. And I think my reaction to that is I, I filled that in my life with coaching that, that I, I feel the most alive that I've ever felt as I think about practice today, you know, and that's, that's the cool thing about being a coach. That's probably why a lot of professional athletes become coaches is that that's close, but, but I think being an athlete combines the mental, the physical and everything, but I do feel sorry for people that um, have to transition. It's gotta be tough. It's, it's, it's not easy. It, it, it's not easy. Um, but again, uh, my 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 journey and my path may be different than than some, but um, you know certainly I, I love coaching. I love working with kids. I really feel like, but I do really feel like my most important contribution is 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 really to be the best husband and father that I can. Sure. You know, and so I get a lot of satisfaction from my current job as a broadcaster for CBS, and and primarily because. I had to overcome so much, you know, personal stuff to, to actually get good at this. And it, it's completely unnatural. Um, and I, I experience pure, pure joy and pure bliss on Sundays. I, I just wow. love it. Um, but, but, you know, I, I love coaching kids. I love developing kids. I love, I love talking about my experiences because, I really think there's a lot that uh, that I can that's happened in my life that I can share to help people, and not just focusing on the successes, but 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 a lot of the failures that I have that that, that have come mm -hmm. and had it, and and really that's where the learning comes from. <laughs>